we're going to look at the different properties of complex conjugates. Talked a little bit about it right at the, the first, um, well, when we first introduced complex numbers, we talked about conjugates. So let's formalise it a bit more now that we know about some other things. So one of the things we can say is that the modulus of a complex number will be the same as the modulus of its conjugate. So remember, the conjugate is just a reflection in the x-axis. So the distance from the origin must stay the same, because it's just a straight reflection. Whereas the arguments, again, because of the reflection in the x-axis, will be the negative of each other. So the argument of a complex number will be the negative of the argument of its conjugate. There's that important z times z conjugate, the difference of two squares which becomes the sum of two squares. The real part squared plus the imaginary part squared is what we had been calling it, but now we know about modulus. We've got a much neater way of saying it as we can say, oh, it's just the modulus squared. The modulus squared. Now this is what I talked about before. The order that you find the conjugate does not matter. So you could add the two numbers together then find the conjugate, or you can find the conjugate of each individual bit and then add them. It, it should give you the same answer. And the same exists with multiplication and division. I didn't bother with subtraction because, of course, addition and subtraction really are the same thing. So subtraction is also true. So it's preserved for all of the four basic operations. And the reciprocal. We want to find the reciprocal of a complex number, then it's the conjugate over the modulus squared. Can I look at this little question? So x plus i y is the square root of 6 plus 2i on 3 minus i. Now don't worry, we, we don't have to work out what this square root is. We just want to show whatever it is, its real part squared plus its imaginary part squared is equal to 2. So I'm going to do it using conjugates. So if x plus i y is the square root of 6 plus 2i on 3 minus i, then when I square it, I'll get rid of the square root sign. I mean, that, that's kind of obvious. So that's the first relationship I want to have a look at. Now, I can take the conjugate of both sides, and they must be the same. So if we have a look at this second expression that I've created, well, we just said with division, it does not matter the order that we do it in. So the conjugate of the right-hand side here would be the conjugate of 6 plus 2i over the conjugate of, of 3 minus i. And the same with the left-hand side. The order that I do it in doesn't matter. So instead of squaring it, then finding the conjugate, I could find the conjugate, then square it. That gives me a second expression. So now all I've got to do to get the x squared plus y squared is multiply these two expressions together. So on the left-hand side, we get x plus iy squared times x minus iy squared. And on the right-hand side, you can see we've got a multiplication. But what we're multiplying by in each instance are conjugates. And when we multiply conjugates together, we know we get the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. So on the left-hand side now, I have x squared plus y squared squared. And on the right-hand side, on the top of the fraction, I'll have 6 squared plus 2 squared over 3 squared plus 1 squared, which is 4. So I now know that x squared plus y squared squared is 4. So x squared plus y squared is equal to 2. Now, I know it's not going to be plus or minus 2, because remember, x and y are real numbers. And when you square a real number, you're always going to get a positive. So it would be impossible to go x squared plus y squared is, is negative 2. Look, they don't actually have an exercise on this in our fake Cambridge. There's a little exercise in Patel on it, so I just thought it'd be fun to have a look at that, playing around with conjugates.